It's cute. Maybe we should address that first. Thank God you don't have black, sh black yeah. uh, shorts. It's so, really strange. Uh, there's been a glaring problem. We'll start right now. There's been a glaring problem that I've been noticing within StrongFit as an organization. And that is this. Yeah. We have a very disproportionate amount of white apparel. It is somewhat racist. I Well, <laughs> not that. <laughs> okay, sorry. My bad. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I guess, yes, absolutely. Yeah, but, totally, but, yeah. but what it is is that I am incapable of maintaining a white shirt's whiteness for more than like three wears. It is an issue. Like between training and... Uh, for whatever reason, my daughter's red clothes showing up with my white yeah. t-shirt. Yeah, yeah, there's been a few issues. Yeah. Yeah. My stuff ends up being this very soft gray after about four washes. Good watches. for you. Me, it's soft pink. So uh, <laughs> every time I'm like, yeah, yeah, she's like, what? <laughs> you know the socks that you put with my yeah. Thank you. Yeah. She's like, oh. The other thing is having a beard and a mustache, especially once the mustache gets weird long. Yeah. You can't even drink water out, yes. of, out of like out of a bottle that, of water. That is true. That is a struggle. Because it's just a it is path a path that water takes. And you go shit. Fuck. Yeah. So if I drink anything that's not water, okay. it goes but but let's talk about that for a second. The reason we are delving into whiteness a lot is because we have ordered shirts four months ago that are still not here. Yeah. Wherever I went in this world, the t-shirt business has to be the most complex to figure out. Yeah. I can't get shirts done. Yeah. I can't get done. Like literally we had those really cool, uh, you know, like the baseball thing, yeah. the uh, sleeves. Yeah. I wanted, you know, like super complex. Black, gray sleeves. Yeah. No. Yeah, mess it up. No. <laughs> no, no, no. It's been, I think, three months now. And, and they don't not. have the large, so they're gonna give us the other one. But and then their printer, we just learned that their printer broke down yesterday, so they're gonna have to ship down the rest of the order to Amsterdam to be finished before. And I'm like, you have. I, but by the way, in the U.S., it was the same shit. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's the same. I remember at Massonomics. I can't get done. We would have. We had an order one time of like, 300 shirts, 400 yeah. shirts, and we're a company that sells more two to four XL shirts. Yes, probably than everybody people. else, yeah. But we also carried extra smalls and stuff, but we carried very few. Not a big female yeah. audience that we had. No, but the, one, the, the male you like to make fun of. Yes, for yeah, sure. Exactly, yeah. But we got a, Operation I remember, skinny I remember we had an order of all of these shirts yeah. and they just mistakenly didn't order two of the extra small shirts. And this order kept dragging on. And like it was two weeks after they said it was going to be done, and they never oh, even said a word. Yeah. And then we're like, so it's a message like, hey, what's the deal? It's like, well, hold on. Two, three days pass, and it's like, oh well, yeah, everything's done, but we're just waiting on them to send us those two extra smalls. And it's like, all right, I've got thousands of dollars worth yes. of inventory that exactly. I'd like to be selling yeah. right now, yeah. and I don't need to hold it up over two fucking shirts that I'm not going to sell that I'll have yeah. to like give to my nephew yeah, yeah, or something. Right. Yes. Like, come on. That's all, yeah, yeah. And that's assuming you don't fuck them up. Yeah, but that's two weeks, dude. Like, I've been at it for months. Yeah. Like, we can't get... So I just... It's like, even if it's slow, at least I can be consistent. I'll just yeah. order early, right? Not even that. Like, it's it's a nightmare. The, when we order in the US, when we order here... What is the t-shirt industry, man. I'm, so I'm not about to volunteer. I am volunteer. not to be blamed for the whiteness. No. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not about to volunteer either, but the only people I know, and granted, we are the furthest thing from an apparel company, but the, most of the people I know in the apparel industry uh, who make a living, like selling shirts in a in mm -hmm. fitness space, the ones that do it either sell a fuck ton of shirts. That's the problem. Or... Yeah. They, the ones who make a living and don't sell a ton, they have to, they run their own screens. They like print their own shirts. Yeah, and I get and it, like, like we order 50 to 100 at yeah. a time and it's not worth it for them, yeah. most likely, but I'm like, ah, then tell me that. Then just tell me to fuck off. Yeah, so. exactly. <laughs> just tell me that up front. So, wait, wait, but we have a bed going, just so you know. Like the dog has been sitting there on the couch, staring into oblivion. Shit. Hang as on. usual. Are we still doing this? Uh, we're still good. I'm okay. sorry. Um, the dog has been staring into oblivion for the last two, three hours, as mm -hmm. usual, right? And we have a bet to know how long, it's, now that we started the podcast, how long it's going to take for him to come right in the middle. I don't know if you noticed in the last two. He likes to be in the middle. So right now, he's just mostly not doing much. But I, I say within the next 20 minutes, he's in the middle again. I agree. I got to thinking about this last night. He doesn't understand what's happening here at all, obviously. We face him. We face him. Yeah. And actually, there's a part of me talk. that thinks... He's like, these fucking guys have been talking to me for a long time. <laughs> yes. And, and we, we, probably we, say hi. Well, we yeah. think he wants to come to us. But yeah. what he is doing is watching us talk at his face for 20 minutes 
And going and like, then he's oh, like, oh, fine, I, guys, gotta, right. I gotta go and say hi or something, <laughs> otherwise they're gonna start crying. <laughs> yeah, he's probably doing us a favor at this stage now. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, 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 I get it. You want me, <laughs> you want my attention. That's probably where it's going. Yep. So for those of you watching, what we do have is just, we're getting constant uninterrupted eye contact from off camera and it's oh, weird. You have no idea. It's really Like we'll, we'll put a camera that way one time just so they can see. <laughs> like I'm saying it should be like, we should do an Instagram account for him or yeah. tag him on it or as the third guest because he's just, it's the most distracting thing ever. He's right in front, right there and he just stares. Yep. That psychopath of a dog. <laughs> he does that to me every time I play pool. So I'm somewhat used to it, but sometimes I'm like, you're going to have to stop judging me. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> Look at him. Poor guy. It's, we are set up. What do you mean? I'm the poor we guy. Are set I up get though. that in front of me all day, every day. We are, set, we are set up though, like right in front of his spot too. It's like... Oh, nice spot. That might actually prepare me for the pool tournaments because uh, like people looking, Weirdos I'm like... looking at you. I'm good. Yeah. You guys have no idea. Anyway. <laughs> So this week, what we want to talk about is, let, let me back up. Yep. We've been doing, you've been doing a lot of new things. You've been developing and dropping in, integrating new things mm -hmm. for almost a year now. Almost a year of exclusively new things. Yes, I yeah. would, I mean, that's going to be something we're going to talk about is the defining them as new things. Yes, I don't right. really see them as new. I see them as the same concept I've always talked about, just more precise, it's more like, advanced. Yeah, and it's almost like more just advanced. looking at it from a different view also. It, it is more advanced. So in that sense, yes, I've, yeah. I've been pushing the advanced stuff yeah. uh, in the last year like crazy. That is true. And, yeah. and, and the thing that I've been, that I like about a lot of it is what it does is gives greater context to some of the real basic stuff yeah. from way back in the beginning. It shows that it was right from the beginning. Yeah, yeah. It's just there's more proof, more validation to what yeah. we've been saying for. And and I think more of a. Five years. It also gives you a more diverse Sorry. approach to get to it, to the information. Well, to meaning, mean, meaning you'll have a, or not, maybe not that. I think a, a more diverse understanding. Yeah, and of what's I, I believe also it, uh, it proves the rightness of the correctness of what we said because yeah. no matter which angle you go at it from you end up in the same place yeah. you know always lead to rome mm -hmm. that kind of tells me uh the concept are solid because no matter which way i go at it i end up in the same place every time yeah. plus and it gives you a little more a wider scope of things to experiment in that yeah. gets you there which means then your understanding of the primary the actual nature of the basic subject yeah is just much better because you've experimented many ways around it and got there. So you really know what you can do to get to it. Through uh, yeah, it. and by the way, they all mean the same. They're just different ways of saying the same thing, which is what I, I like with all that. Like the true, uh, we're gonna go back to Charles Munger. Mm -hmm. You know that PDF that I, that I talked about, like yeah. that, uh, the stuff that I, that I read before the Barbell Shop podcast. I remember it was like six months, a year before. That was a, uh, for my, career as a coach was very important because it allowed me, to, I, I love the way he was looking at, at, at his own job. So, so for people that don't know, right? It was a lecture done in 19, uh, I believe 84 or 94 okay. uh, through the business school at USC. Charles Munger doesn't write, but he did a lot of business lectures. So Charles Munger, so you don't know, is a Warren Buffett's right hand man, right? So he's the, he's the co-owner, basically he runs with Warren Buffett, uh, Berkshire Hathaway. Mm -hmm. And he's one of the, I would say, brightest, sharpest financial mind out there. And so he did that, that talk at USC and he was talking about the points of worldly wisdom, right? So he said that uh, it's fascinating, like uh, I have the PDF and then we'll post it, where he was explaining like to him, he looks at, at um, financing through the lens of certain, what he calls points of worldly wisdom which is, I believe, a list of 24 principles. And then that's how he gauges whether they're going to invest in a company or not. Mm -hmm. The health of a company is always based on those particular points. And none of them really are about finance. They are about uh, strong principles of life, basically, yeah. of everyday stuff that, you know, like critical mass, that's from mm -hmm. physics, some accounting, but psychology, uh, all that stuff that allow him to have a good understanding of what is in front of him. And so that was extremely uh, important to me because he was like that is to me that is the correct way to look at a problem not fragmented because yeah. that's what I do so I'm going to look at it from my own lens is like uh, if a principle is right it should work for everything it should yeah. work for life not just for yeah. training so if a principle that I use for training is correct it should apply to life and I think that's important because like you said in, in finance in their case yeah. specifically 
I think in finance and fitness and everything, what happens is we often only look for ways through it via the lens of finance and the yeah. lens of fitness. And the problem is uh, you get into say fitness, what happens is it's like, okay, well, I only want to think principles of what we understand in fitness. So energy chemistry, system. biology, yeah, 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 yeah. you know. And it, biology, it, bullshit. Yeah. Uh, energy systems. Well, that's the thing is they look at biology one, for only what? Only so far, yeah. When it relates to fitness. Yeah. So they're going to, the problem is this confirmation but bias. Not, or yeah, yeah. But, but it's not, like energy systems, but not really truly biology. Because if you go to biology, but, you end up with some questions you can't really answer. Yeah. So you end up, it's like a quantum mechanical thing yeah. where you're like, what does that mean? We don't know. So they, they look at, it's almost like a ca bad case of confirmation bias in the fitness industry is they look at what justify what they are doing yeah. most of the time, yeah. right? It's super fragmented in that sense. And, and, and they're not the only one, by the way. No. Archaeology is the same, like it's yeah. this, that, you know, that's why we do and then we don't move at all. Yeah, there's great examples in archaeology with guys like, there's a guy like Graham Hancock. There's yeah. lots of studies that they've been doing and lots of research he's been yeah. doing for decades that says maybe some civil, some of these yeah. civilizations are much older than than we think. And then what's, and you hear many of the things, the the pushback and the thing just against the truth. Yeah. Because it's like, well, we just don't want to know anymore. Pseudoscience. Kind of, yeah. Uh, but th the problem is they're not, they're never attacking the claim. They're attacking the guy. Yeah. And that's usually when yeah. you, whenever you're attacking the guy, not the claim, usually, you know, the, the messenger, yeah. but not the message, that tells you something right away. It says yeah. more about you than it does about yeah. the messenger, usually. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so that's what in the case of Hancock, because he's a journalist first, but he's like, but now he has the backing of, very legitimate scientist and people are like, no, it's very, th that case was, was fascinating to me because what he was talking, when he was talking about archaeology, you saw in uh, physics, mm -hmm. is something called the Copenh uh, Copenhagen interpretation that I talked about all the time where uh, quantum mechanics was decided, I think it was 1920, 22 or 25, uh, in Copenhagen at the University of Niels and that's the way we are going to look at it. So yeah. you had Schrodinger, Einstein, some major thinkers on one side, and Niels Bohr and his student, uh, uh, all those guys on that side. And because Niels Bohr was m louder and more charismatic than mm -hmm. Einstein in the sense of he had a group of people and stuff like that, they kind of won the argument. And yeah. after that, for, I kid you not, like over 80 years, you were not allowed to question the Copenhagen interpretation. Uh, if you were to do your dissertation for your PhD on that, they would tell you, no, it, you will not pass it. It yeah. will destroy your career. David's Bohm, David's, David Bohm, which was one of the, a great American philosopher, but one of the best uh, theoretical physicists, got buried because of that. That and the fact that he was communist during McCarthyism, which yeah. was not a good thing. But he also... Just bad timing, really. Yeah, bad timing. <laughs> but he also got buried because he went at the Copenhagen interpretation, which you are not allowed to do. He took forever and some guys with big balls to to go at it so archaeology is facing the same issue where they're like no and and you see that in science a lot where a guy keeps pushing and then they wait until he's dead or he's not relevant anymore to yeah. say yeah he was right but in the meantime they'll crucify the guy yeah. for 40 years yeah i see that in science all the time well and in that case too oh. in, in in the hancock case is what basically is happened too is what's finally getting more validation is having to go to Outside sources from yep. Archaeology, meaning he's having to validate his stuff through geologists and climate science. The and geologists are the ones that are on board with him because yeah. you can't deny like what they see. We've already mapped yes. this fucking time. We know that. You know, and yeah. it's like, so these yeah. things all line up. So Yeah, so he's getting his information from geologists yeah. because he can't get it from archaeologists because they won't go there. Yeah. Welcome to the fitness industry. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. yeah like there's certain dogma that you're not, you know, calories in versus calorie out. By the way, when I say that, let's be honest. Uh, the really good ones don't th say that. No. It's, so th there's that top of the pyramid where usually they know they don't always know. The real good uh, ones don't speak in absolutes either. It's you know why? Because only Sith Lords yes. deal with absolutes. That's my, why. And, and it's of, the dark side of the force. And of course, that's, that's funny too, is when I speak on things, my first temptation is to always be absolute just because I don't want to. It's but, like, yes, no, but bullshit, But by the way, good. that's the best thing about that statement. He's saying only the Sith Lord is an absolute, <laughs> yes, is an absolute like, statement. I guess. Yes. So <laughs> does that mean, uh, you know, like it's he like, was... what have you become? It, well, it, no, but that's, <laughs> that's the problem is that it's, um, it's not uh, Anakin that says that. It's, uh, what's his name? So that means yeah. that he's becoming a Sith Lord as well yeah. because he's starting to speak in absolutes. <laughs> and I was like, 
That's a logical fallacy. Yeah. That's how big of a nerd I am. I'm watching Star Wars going a logical fallacy. <laughs> but anyway. Yeah. I like, uh, <laughs> I do like the, my, I so remember his name. Here's, here's, how, here's how my favorite. Ben Kenobi. Yes. My ben favorite uh, um, way to tell of a good mm. lit, litmus test for people in the fitness space, in the nutrition space, is that when they get asked a question, um, like, about a thing like okay, I have mm-hmm. a person in this situation and they need this or this here and here. The I'll tell you this: if you want to really sound like you know what's right, the answer is always, always, always starts with it depends, yeah. because it does, it and does. so it depends on the person, depends on this, depends on that. Which is true. And, and you can so, also hide behind that one. Of course, you yes. can hide behind it. But I, it's and, true. And, and, yeah. and it, but I, but that's a thing where it's like, all right, well, at least I know you're getting at the right thing because it yeah. depends. It depends on the person. Yeah, I like it's that. like, um, that's why I always know like the conversation is going to go badly on Instagram. When the guy says, uh, science has proven that. Yeah. I was like, oh boy. <laughs> like, and then the like, calories in versus calories out or shit like that. Yeah. I was like, no, that, there's no consensus. When they say the consensus, I'm like, there's no consensus yeah. in nutrition, for example. None. None. Whatsoever. Like, be- why? Because some diets work for some and others. Like, we need to explain. We need to figure out why, by the way, this is yeah. like that. But there is no consensus in nutrition and uh, a consensus means you're talking about 90% plus of scientists agreeing on one thing. Yeah. So it's past a principle, it's a consensus, right? That means the, the entire industry is agreeing and you're not going to get that. The idea that, you know, like uh, being at a calorie deficit makes you lose weight uh, and then being a calorie surplus makes you gain weight and it's that simple, no. Yeah. Like there's plenty of studies that shows you you can gain weight without getting into a calorie uh, surplus. Yeah. So it, it doesn't work like that. So yeah. that's why, yeah, you see a lot of that. There's a lot of dogmatic views in, in uh, most of science and in fitness industry is not a science, but it, it is hooked to medical science and it's and I think, just as many as the other ones. And I think that's why you prefer to attach things to concepts and principles as yes. opposed to like whatever that is. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because I, f- I always feel like the conversation gets so pigeonholed that... Uh, that's, that's a little bit my problem that I see in, in a lot of the studies is you have to understand that truth relates to context, mm-hmm. always. Most of the studies, it's not that it's not valid or not true, it's just that they are true in a specific context. Yeah. So my question every time becomes, can that context be applied to everyday life, to everyday people or even athletes? And that's where I disagree with a lot of stuff when they say this study shows that, I'm like, yes, this study shows that in that context, yeah. but that context is not the context that athlete is in mm-hmm. because life is not that controlled environment. Like if you look at studies, it's mostly done into university. So it's younger people, uh, you know, not necessarily have a, have a day job because if you have a day job, you don't have the time to do a study. Uh, people you give 30 uh, euros for, for t- and most people that make money are not going to waste their time. So yeah. th- there's a lot of stuff that go as to who the study is made on and the context around the study that uh, does not invalidate the study, but it might invalidate the application of the yeah, study into your field. Makes it a little less applicable to right. everybody. But else. the problem is that does. Uh, it's not a problem, but the thing is that doesn't mean the study is invalid mm-hmm. either. So you can say, well, the study is true in that context, but that doesn't mean you are in that context. So if yeah. you try to apply that study to you, it might not work. Yeah. Right? That's what I see a lot. And then when that happens, they go like, well, it's your fault. Yeah. You know, like the, the athlete didn't do that, or the person where well, you're weak mentally or whatever. Maybe the person isn't weak mentally. Maybe we are fucking up the the way we look at things. You know, it's like the the that podcast we did on the, yesterday for us uh, <laughs> on the, the selfish brain theory. Maybe that will explain why obese people always crave food. Maybe it's not just fatty, you have a problem. They have a problem. And maybe there is a psychological issue there. Yeah. But maybe there's also a software issue that, unfortunately, years of abuse to themselves. Yeah. So maybe psychological reasons, but maybe they started overeating as a way to cope with stress because yeah. they didn't, instead of fighting it, they but decided to... But either way, to, things are coded to Yeah, and it's that. not just the hypothalamus now, it's not just the chemical stuff, it's that the software now is basically making them get worse and worse and worse. So you can't just say, fatty, stop eating. Yeah. Right? It's because it's not just conscious decision and chemical set. There's something in between those two. Right? That's, and the studies don't don't engage those. That, that analogy you just made is the perfect way to start into specifically what we want to talk yeah. to today. Right? So one of the basic things that you talked about forever, really, yep. um, was the control function. Um, that's course, actually part of the Charles Munger thing. Okay. I think, I think that's 
Maybe I got it. From, no, 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 no. Sorry. That's uh, but it's back to the time of Charles Munger when I was looking for my 24, not 24, but you know, for the principles. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to an engineer and then well, I might even got it from Charles Munger, one or the other. Yeah, yeah but it, com it comes from that time. Yeah. So we're talking at least like, and, four and years, without years. Uh, yeah. if, if, if you're watching, of course, we're not at the whiteboard, but the control function is essentially a straight line. Yeah. that would be your true zero on a yeah. graph. And then you have perfection. Perfection. That yeah. is perfection. Yeah. That is exactly where, whether it's movement, food, mm -hmm. behavior, yeah. anything, that system is operating optimally. Then you have varying degrees of deviation exactly. above and below that'll scoop high. And hopefully as time pr passes, right. so that tightens up. It's usually, That's the image and I'll ways. have the image on it's the two cover. Ways. Either the oscillation gets big. Imagine a pendulum swing. That's what it represents, yeah. right? Either the pendulum swings gets bigger or it gets smaller. When yeah. it gets bigger, that means the that amplitude, that oscillation represents mistakes. Yeah. The amplitude of the mistake, right? So I, if it gets better, uh, smaller, so it, it, it's called a well damped control function because you start with huge mistakes and they get smaller over time. Yeah. And if they go the other way, it's, uh, you know, not well damped control function. Mm -hmm. That means the, the, the amplitude of the mistakes are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. And, and for me, that was a very interesting mm -hmm. thing for me as a, as a new coach, especially when I was starting, yeah. is I didn't, I, I actually thought going into it that my job was I'm going to go in and you're, if you don't move well, that I have to get you to move well today. And, 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 I, and yeah. what, what happens is that's when you, I would see people start to seek a position yes, over, over tension. tension. Yeah, exactly. And they start to, it's like, because they got to get them there fast. And you, I loved it because it made me look at things and knowing I just needed to start to prioritize their process which meant I know, all right, we need to do this. Let's fix this and we tighten and we keep. And, and, and you have to allow for some sort of failure, mistakes, because right. just like you said, if you can't walk up to somebody and say, hey, lunchbox, put down the fork. And yeah. they're not just gonna be like, all right, cool. All right. Well, I'm just helping I'm done. you. Yep. Perfect. Because it will never, ever, ever work. That fun, yep. That's never gonna go from wide deviation yeah, exactly. to, to zero yeah. in a hurry. So what I liked about the control function is to me, it showed me two, two things. First of all, a straight line. You're never going to get it. Mm -hmm. So imagine it's a spiral around a straight line and you're trying to get closer to the straight line, but you're never going to get there. Yeah. So that, I like that. And then uh, because welcome to dealing with humans, mm -hmm. that's, that's what happens, right? Uh, and then the second part that I like is introduce the idea of time, Yeah. right? That, it, uh, that you cannot judge uh, progress on on one thing not on a, and not on a snapshot either. not on a snapshot that it's a movie not a snapshot not a yeah. picture right and by the way that's true for a lot of things because if you look you're not going to learn a technique on the olympic one lifting just by looking at a picture i mean you you can try but i that's, fucking that's, had a guy once yeah, yeah. i fucking tell you what yeah. but whatever <laughs> i had a guy who never snatched never yeah. did anything came in he had done some obstacle course race training <laughs> and was very fit but mm -hmm. never did any no real weight room stuff, yeah. no barbell stuff. And I think like, I don't know, a few weeks in, we had the snatch thing and it was like some cycling or whatever, yeah. or something, we didn't do a lot of it. But I went to him, I was like, hey, we haven't talked this out in the thing yeah. since you've been here, so I'm just gonna have you do something else yeah. for now. And he looks at me and says, well, can you just demo it for me one more time? I'm like, sure, it was like power, hand yeah. powers or something. And he looks at me and he goes, and he grabs his bar, Fucking perfect. Fucking shit hurts my feelings so much to this day. Okay, this one guy. This one guy. So yeah. you're not that guy. And then there's guy. a million after that. But you're yeah, exactly. Guy. Yeah, and he's an exceptional athlete and everything. For, yeah. But um, the, the problem also is, like, for example, you take that guy, right? Yeah. He starts at a low amplitude. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean there is no mistake. Correct. Right? There's a low amplitude Absolutely. of mistake, right? Yeah. I'm, say, I'm saying it was perfect as in, like, there's nothing I'm going to give you today. Right, exactly. <laughs> but uh, as he tries to get better, right? The problem is to try to get straight to that perfection. That's where a lot of the, the shit happens. Like imagine if you're studying a car, like it's, that's the drawing I use at the seminar all the time. You have basically, you have a, a hill like this and you have a car on it. So is the car going up or down? Yeah, if you just Unless, had a picture. Yeah, if you had a picture, yeah. you could never tell, right? Let's yeah. say you can't see where the wheel, well, even with the wheel, you still wouldn't yeah. know which way it goes, right? Uh, the key is unless you know what happened before, you don't know what's going to happen after, right? Mm -hmm. they, this, you, you need, you have to look at it as a set of images and not, not a single one. So it's a movie, not, not a picture, right? And also what was very important to me was with that idea of time because it represented the job of a coach. Yeah. What it meant is that for a coach, 
you this is where you start and it doesn't matter first of all no right you don't get to judge that person walking in on working in that day uh, based on how they do that day that's a mistake we all make no. and i think but let's start with that one i think that's a mistake a lot of us made uh i would say that's ego that's the dark side of the force mm -hmm. that, that's so the analogy i use is um you know what planet dagoba the empire struck back luke is training under yoda and then he goes to the dark cave and he sees that and he asks yoda why will i because yoda tells him to go into the dark cave and uh, luke asks why will i find in there and Yoda tells him, whatever you bring with you. And a lot of that happens in coaching. Yeah. We bring ourselves into our coaching, mm -hmm. which is normal because we're humans, but there are a few I think there's parts, pitfalls. There's parts of yourself that you need to make sure you, you have in check before few, you do it. There's a few pitfalls. Because I think bringing yourself into your coaching is required. Required. Always. It is an art. Yep. So required. And, and, and so, and if you coach without the better parts of yourself involved in it, then yep. you're just never, not, you're going to miss connection also. You're not coaching. Um, yep. And then, however, nobody, we all have flaws. flaws. Yep. And, and, and I remember, you know, in my case, it was, I was easily frustrated and sometimes impatient and I tend to over communicate everything. Yeah, so when it, I, so when yeah. I would coach, yeah. I would, I could catch myself like, mm -hmm. fuck, all right, stop talking. you're doing it again. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah, stop talking. But uh, me, I realized very quickly that there was a profound drive to not want people to look a certain way in my gym. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I was like, yeah, and, and then I've seen that with a lot of coaches as well. It's like, if you train here, you're going to move correctly. I agree completely. That is, for me, a requirement of a good gym. He's a coach that thinks that way. But, but that doesn't do mean they're going to move correctly today. Yeah. Exactly. So, and, and that goes down to also the core of who you are as a coach is you want everybody to do so well, right? Yeah. So you want people to do well today. And the job is not the straight line. The job is better. Mm -hmm. That's also something I had the hardest time to get to wrap my head around. And so I want that like, if you're part of my gym, I'm a movement, movement specialist, you're going to move well. Problem with that is that meant like sometimes I was I felt the pull toward making them look good. Yeah. But at the expense of what? Yeah. Right. That's sometimes at the expense of their body because they are not ready. And especially they when should you not go there. And especially when you're worried about how something looks, that's when you do get into that. It's like fuck. It's positional attention. Yeah, and then you're worried about the wrong things. Because a good deadlift at first might look like shit, mm -hmm. but at least the spine is not moving. Whereas I can make you look great, and then you blow up your back every single time. Yeah. There's a very strong pull toward that because who wants to be the coach whose athletes move like shit? Mm -hmm. okay, then then you look bad. Yep. And that's the dark side of the force, right? So, t so here's the, here's the funny. When we had our spot, our, my CrossFit gym that, we, that I owned was on Main Street, downtown, mm -hmm. floor-to-ceiling windows yeah. all the way across. Exactly. The and everybody looking. And, and, so, yeah. and so for me, it was really interesting trying to figure out, like, as I'm scaling things or putting, allow, give, it's kind of helping people set their range of motion for certain yep. things. You know, if I, you have somebody with a... You know, a yeah, thing, but it, it, yeah. it's like, all right, well, you can still Stop press, yeah. but just don't lock it out for now. Yeah. I want you to find it. And, and so do this. But then what happens is you get that temptation. We're like, well, what if someone else who yeah. sees people not so locking out their like, presses? Don't do that. Yeah, don't do then, the, the thing with the trap. Yeah. Put the fork down. Yeah, that becomes that. Exactly. It's like, fix that now. Yeah. And, and that becomes, and, and everything you described, and the put down the fork now, fix your trap. Yeah, it negates, don't do that. It negates the process. And it gets the human. And it negates the human. And also it is treating a symptom. Yes. And not the problem. Yeah. By the way, when you say don't do that, you're not giving him a way to do it. No. You're just telling him, don't shrug. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. It's like, well, I like, just well, found out I was doing it when you told me. Yeah. So again, we're going back to these two things. There's chemical uh, reactions and a conscious mind mm -hmm. and nothing in between. So therefore, <coughs> if you don't want to shrug on a press, you won't. And I'm like, oh, come on, guys. Yeah. Like the body is a lot smarter than that. Why? Because there's a software. The software will make you shrug until you figure out why. So that, the, the, the control function was very important in that sense because he, um, it explained coaching to me. And one of the biggest things for me, again, was looking at it going like, my job is not, for example, someone comes, can't squat below parallel. My job is not below parallel. No. Th then I realized, because that, that's actually started the conversation with the internal talk in my head and everything. I was like, my job is better. Right. So I have grandma. 
most likely, especially with a barbell, grandma will never break parallel, mm -hmm. right? So I was like, so, and then, you know, at first, young coach, you try to make them break parallel, you try to make them break parallel. With a barbell, clients over 50. Yep. Uh, I mean, like, first of all, and then, so he brought up two questions. First question is, should they? But even past the should they, I realized that I give them a, a sandbag, and then they all break parallel. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah. Like, I've been trying to make you do that for six months. I give you a sandbag, you break parallel, and your form is great. Mm -hmm. I was like, so that rocked my, at the time, uh, I, I couldn't understand why the sandbag works so well. It kind of rocked my way of thinking, because I was like, first of all, I've been pounding them on a barbell, right? Where they can't break parallel without looking at they're going to kill themselves, which, by the way, means I fail as a coach. Because yeah. if you are forcing your clients to, to break parallel when they don't have the capacity, you're teaching position over tension, you're failing as a coach. And just by switching the exercise, I got what I wanted them to do in the first place. Yeah. So tell me that's not an ego trip on my part to, make that, to say that you have to break parallel with a barbell. I was like, now they're bre breaking parallel with a sandbag looking better than with a barbell. So first of all, it was two things. It was like, maybe right now they should do the sandbag instead of the barbell. And second of all, why is the sandbag working yeah. that the barbell isn't? I was like, all right, oh my God. And then that got me toward the internal torque and everything. Yeah. But it was a very important moment because I realized that it was not about perfect, good, whatever the fuck you want to call it, it was about better. Yeah. That's it. My job was better over time. That's it. And that dials in exactly to what we talked about a few episodes ago with exploration versus exploitation. Same is, idea. Is, is, is if, say that person, that client, if their goal soon, whatever, is that they want to express or exploit their strength and skill with the barbell, then yes, we'll get you from where you are now, we'll go to what we can get better, better, and we'll go sandbag to parallel, but and then we can get you to barbell. Maybe, and we like whatever all we need to do to get but you there. But if you're yeah. a person who doesn't need it, doesn't ever need to express it that way with that, then let's just do better, yeah. and let's just keep leaning into better. No, but plus, right. I have no, uh, no problem with a barbell. Yeah. But like, let's say, like, you know... But if someone is going to have a problem... What, what if it takes you six months of work to break parallel with a barbell, uh, you know, like yeah. with your hips achy, where Without it takes me... Without getting much training volume in either. Yeah, and yeah. it gets me one month to do it with a sandbag. And I'm like, all right, guys, like, uh, again, like, ego gets in the way. Yeah. My greatest failure as a coach was actually that. Um, my command gets to the point where he can lap an 80 kilo sandbag, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, by the way, 65-year-old Michael Mann, weighing 160, right, uh, soaking weight, uh, never trained a day in his life. He was, I think, my greatest success as, uh, as a coach, right? I talk about him all the time. Uh, very, very good friend of mine, uh, top of it. He laps the 80 kilo, 80 kilo sandbag, does three reps. Shit. Nice. Good reps, break parallel, everything. I was like, and in my mind, I'm like, I'm kind of curious to see what happens with a barbell. Mm -hmm. I won't lie. So next session, we put some weight, and then there's 135 on the bar, 60 kilos. So 20 kilos less than the sandbag. And the first two reps, you know you when you make the face? Like, yeah. And then I'm like this, mm -hmm. right? Literally like this. <laughs> and he goes, three, four, five. Reps three, four, five are my greatest failure as a coach. I should have stopped him at two. Yeah. He did five reps. Everything was fine. No back pain, no knee pain. I should never have let him do three, four, and five because he looked in a way where he had no business putting 60 kilos on his, on his back. And like, the, he wasn't even the, in the same... It wasn't the same exercise. Yeah. Him squatting with a sandbag and him doing whatever the fuck that was, was, you know, like knees forward, so all of the patella tendons. Yeah. Thank God he was strong from the sandbag, otherwise he would have hurt himself. Yeah. And that's my greatest failure as a coach because there was a curiosity as to how come the sandbag works and then the, sand, the barbell doesn't. Because the hands up, he didn't have a squat problem, he had a barbell problem. Mm -hmm. Shoulder, everything, he just could not sustain the weight on his... Problem was upper back, not the rest. Yeah. So, but I should have stopped at two and go like, no. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. Like the work I'm doing with the sandbag is more beneficial to him than the barbell at this stage. And because you kind of maybe tried to to rush to dampen that a little bit faster, do you want to see where things were, see how close it was? To no, better, but or? let's be honest. I wanted to, I thought it was badass to make him squat with a barbell because yeah. then I could put it on Instagram yeah. and, you know, like it makes me look good. And that, that's all and maybe, it's worth. So, so that, that, that that's more about just what you brought into the cave then. It's like, I'm, totally. I'm going to plug That's why it's my greatest thing. failure as a coach yeah. because I'll let. My ego, my vanity, gets yeah. in the way of his well-being, and that's exactly, a betrayal. That is an that's a betrayal in, of the ethics of a coach. Yeah, it's an unnecessary increase in risk. Yeah, especially if you fuck yeah, you do know sixty-five better. on on yeah. a barbell with weight. Now, yeah. that that is a direct breach of 
uh, the ethics of a coach. Yeah. So that, must, that is my greatest failure. Nothing happens, thank God. Yeah. Otherwise, I'd still be beating my head against the wall on that one. But still, that is my greatest failure as a coach. Yeah. I let my vanity get in the way do of you, his well-being. And that, you can do that with your own shit, not yeah. with somebody else's. Yeah. yeah. Do you do this, like, so when, when I think of the control function, what I like to do, especially in coaching, yes. is I will look at any number of scenarios that I see with an athlete. It's essentially just goal setting is mm -hmm. what I look at. Yeah. Here's where we are. There's some problems. This is where we'd like to be. And do you do anything as far as like maybe mapping, like mapping out to prioritize some of these things? I mean, everything's going to depend yeah. on the movement, the situation, whether it's yeah, but, nutrition. But from and... coaching, there's a, to me, so you, you said exploration versus exploitation, mm -hmm. right? That's a notch. I look at it, memorization versus learning, Yeah. right? Exploration is learning. Exploitation is memorization where uh, you know something works because you've seen your coach do it or an athlete do it and everything and you try to implement it in what you do which is a normal way of looking at it right mm -hmm. this worked i need to make it work okay that's exploitation but exploitation without exploration does not work so before you can memorize something and put it in the back it you have to learn it first that is stockfish versus alpha zero that we talk about all yeah. the time it's like you get the you you get the lesson you forget the experience yep. People try to memorize stuff and not learn. I see it all the time. So I think that's actually one of the greatest weakness that I see in coaches is that, that this works. So all I got to do is memorize it and then it'll work. Nah. It doesn't plug anything into anybody else. Yeah. It doesn't work. It's no. um, thinking you can learn to cook by reading recipes. And I see that way too much. Like, that's why they all like, you see a lot of coaches are jealous of their programming. Mm -hmm. Like I, they don't want to share it, and I'm like, yeah, sure. Like yeah. I'll, I'll tell uh, templates and everything. I'm like well, you want, like people ask me what's on it. I'm like, I'll show you right now. I'll show you a sample. Yeah. I'll show you two weeks, three weeks. Like jealous of your programming. I'm like, do you think that's what sense makes your athletes better? Is yeah. your programming? Like guys, I'm sorry to tell you. Like if you're doing course of programming and everything, you need to know how to program. Yeah. There's no doubt, right? And you should take the courses that teach you that. But if for a second you think that's where progress is, is that means you're too young into your, into your field. Yeah. Like you can fuck people up by not programming correctly. Yeah. That's for sure. But once you have programming, then the work starts. Yeah. And it's about learning, right? And so most of that stuff is being done, not memorized. Yeah. Right? Learning is about doing. Yeah. Right? I would say... You know, it's another art in a way. I think memorization is enduring and learning is doing. Yeah. Right? Just like you endure your conditioning workout, you memorize your uh, education. Yeah. Right? And that's enduring. That's a flight mode. To me, memorization is flight. You memorize only what you did not understand. Yeah. That actually makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Because that's, that's my go-to. <laughs> it's like, oh, I got to remember this, got to remember this, got to remember this. Because I don't want to know it either. Or because uh, you haven't me, integrated. Just, no, but yeah. you haven't had that epiphany moment. You haven't, yeah. you know, like that epiphany moment. What is an epiphany to me is that moment where Alpha Zero changed his code to, uh, because he became better by understanding what happened on the chessboard. Yeah. Right? That moment where you let the experience go, but you keep the lesson. That's uh, learning because you have incorporated that knowledge within you well, within then, your own code exactly that knowledge yep. that in, obviously knowledge and information different things but information as we speak of it in the context from a couple episodes ago yep. that 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 information has to yep. become a part of you exactly and I think and, and and for me it took me a long time to figure out because that's not how you're taught at school necessarily no, I don't for I don't. Me, at least not where I was from so so it was very much Memorize these are the things, right. this is what because you know. they don't care whether you can use it or integrate it. That is yeah. not the point of, of school. The point of school is average enough that you can work at the factory, yeah. And I don't mean that in a mean way, I mean that was literally the goal. I do, I think it's terrible. No, I think it's <laughs> terrible too, but that is literally you have to understand like school the way it is now was created 150 years ago for that purpose. It was to take the kids away from the farms to give them a basic average education they could use in factory where we wanted everybody to be. Yeah. That's basically industrial revolution, right? Yep. Where we need to pull people away from farms into the cities to make them work in factories. Yeah. And that's what school was created for. Yeah. And you can you nothing can, else. You can get a kid very used to at a very young age doing what they're told and working Memorization. and doing shit for You don't need to understand straight. how the yeah. machine works when you're working on the on the fucking chain. Yeah. You just need to memorize what he has to do. And then you do eh, eh, eh. Yeah. it's Charlie Chaplin, you know, in the in the, in yeah. the factory. And so uh, many times that's what memorization is. It's a failure to integrate the knowledge, yeah. right? And, and so 
I think that's the biggest problem that I see with coaches is that is that they resort. It's a flight mode. They resort to memorization because they don't have. It's and and like you had said, is that memory memorization? They pe people view that as the end result, as opposed to the journey. Meaning 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 it's like just like with we talk with the control it's functions. Like just, yeah. I'm just going to get to the to perfection. Right. Well, you can memorize what perfection is. That's fucking adorable. You can look at it on a picture and luck. go like, I want that. I'm yeah. like, yeah, sure, yeah. I want that too. Except it's fucking getting, 20 years. But yeah, getting exactly. to perfection is not what that is. Like yeah. like like for you to do that to get to there. You got to go from here to here. The control function tells you there is no destination. Yeah. There's only a journey there. And yeah. I think there's a tremendous lesson about life in that. There is no destination. Yeah. Like, by the way, even on a, if we go talk about a chemical level or the software, it's true as well. There is no such thing as happiness. What makes you happy is not the happiness, not the destination. It's the journey there. We know that the second you get the outcome that you thought was going to make you happy, you're not happy anymore. Yeah. What was interesting was to get there. That's, that's how the shit works. And that's what the control function really tells you, is that it's, the, it's a journey, not the destination. And I think if you do it right, though, what I like is, is that process of the mm -hmm. dampening of the control function. I like that when, he, when a person has made progress, I get when, when I feel, what's the word? I don't know, happy or proud or whatever yeah. when, it, when you're coaching somebody because they've covered a lot of ground. It really has nothing to do with the fact that they now can squat well to parallel or yeah. now they've lost 20 kilos. Yeah, it's not that it's, isn't it. What it is is that, that I know what we what they, first off, put into that process. And I know what step one meant to yep. them and step two. And that was, you know, and, and, and that being here now isn't what it is. It's everything that you did before that. And so, by the way, that's a very good point. Like we always say, you know, it's about becoming the human that can do whatever yeah. it is that you want to do, right? If you look at the control function, you look at it, the, the only way you're going to understand where you are is by looking at the totality of it. Where are you on the graph, yeah. right? And so I like that idea a lot because it forces you also to look at the past. I see too many athletes that are just never happy with where they are because they don't look at where they were. Mm -hmm. They only look at where they want to be. Yeah. yeah, but that's the problem with goal setting, by the way. Goal setting means you, you fail every second up until the moment where you reach the goal. And that becomes that where you can't see the forest through the trees. You know, you're lost in the woods and you're fucking walking and walking and walking and you're 10 steps away from the edge, from the fucking street. Y yeah. And you don't see it. So and you, you don't change see direction. It. Yeah, and by the way, but it's also the, the problem with goal setting in that aspect of uh, you're never happy because you're failing, mm -hmm. because you haven't reached the goal. The problem is when you reach a goal, you realize that that's not the point. That was never the point, was never the outcome, was the journey there. So yeah. during the journey, you only thought about destination. And once you reach the destination, you realize it's all about the journey. So now you set the next goal and then you're back to this is about the destination. So you fuck up the journey. And when you get there, you realize, I don't care about the destination. It was a journey. And you can do that for an entire lifetime. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you can burn out very quickly with that too. Well, yeah, because by the second time, you put all the work and then we go back to what we talked about in the last podcast, which yeah. you never celebrate victories. Yeah, it's because not, then it's the, nothing but suffering and disappointment because even though you yes. accomplish something, you're disappointed by how it feels. Yeah, and again, like, and because you never look back, you never realize how far you've come. Yeah. And if you can't realize how far you've come, there is no victory. Yeah. There's only disappointment because you're never good enough. You never will be. That's why a guy like Matt Frazier keeps training. There's always going to be a voice in your head that, that tells you this is not good enough. Yeah. It's never good enough. It's never finished. Until I get Charles Xavier's superpowers, <laughs> I'm not done. Yeah. Right? And even if I get that, I was like, can I be Wolverine too? Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's never, you guys are laughing, but I'm dead serious. Um, it's never enough. So. You, you have to be able to look at the graph. Like, first of all, I'm not done. There's always all that, because that's another problem too. If you think yeah. you're like, if you're happy, if you reach a goal and you're happy about it, you're fucked. Yeah. Because then you have to find something else. That happened to me in, in some sport where I was like, I'm good. Done. Yeah. Never completed it. Well, and well, and I think, and I think if you do it right and you view things within the lens of what we're talking mm -hmm. about today is that gives you, at least for me, it gives me when I look at an athlete or yeah. say I'm just going with someone with nutrition. I look at it and I go, okay, well, what I can get by making sure I look through things with this lens is I will get perspective. Yes. I know I have to have patience. Perspective. Uh, I know what the progression is going to be and I'm going to have a plan. It's, for me, it's, it's all that. It's exact. And perspective being the number one. Because, yeah. like, are you better than you were? Yes. Then you're doing good. Yeah. Right. Did you reach your full potential? No. All right. So we have work to do. Good. Then 
Yeah, yeah we got shit to do. Because awesome. The, because the road from being being fat and sedentary to being fit and doing bar muscle ups, there's so many things. There's so many process. in between. Meaning, meaning you need perspective. And you, and need, you will, by the way, and you need you to are know, the person need to change. Yeah. Yeah. And so you need to know when you're working with a person like that that it's like. I know this is what they want, but you then need to get them to buy in on the process, yes. and that's the tricky part. And and that's that's why these basics, I think, are are it's it's the most important thing to communicate to your clients. Those much of these larger concepts you can use for yourself, Perspective. but I think a yeah. person, yeah. your person, needs to understand that here is where you are. We're going to tighten this up to here. I understand that, but we need to work on this. And then this, and then this. And, then and this. by the way, and every step of the way, say, look where we started. Yeah, yeah. Look how much progress you made. This is the number one issue that I see. Me is people that can't see how much progress they've made. How many people lose a hundred pounds and you can tell they still hate themselves? Mm -hmm. I'm like, and I understand that you don't look the way you want because most likely you're looking at a dude on Instagram who has a perfect light and he's a fucking freak anyway. Yeah. And God knows what he's doing on well, the side. And often uh, people in those situations never have liked the way that they looked. So the question is and, where... And, you, and in that case, never will. Yeah. So then, might as well, fuck, cemetery already. <laughs> like, but at the same time, like I try to tell them, say, do you understand what it takes to lose 100 pounds? Like, you've done it, so obviously you know what it takes, but you don't realize how hard it is for mm -hmm. most people to lose 20 pounds. Like, yeah. I had some guys that lost half their body weight from 140 kilo to 70. I was that's like, crazy. dude, yeah. that's amazing. What it takes to do that is mind-boggling well, and the guys and are like and you can tell they're not happy i was like dude you plus, should be so proud and and i think it, and i think it's important for that too is though when so for an outsider when you view something like that or, or not you but someone else yeah. you view someone who's lost 100 pounds and maybe they're not just super happy with the way they look usually and, yeah. and 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 that that is normal but but one of the things you said is that there that it's such a magnitude of work that goes into it right but we talk about this all the time is that you need to change who you are, yep. and and so they don't view it as it's it's not this magnitude of work. It is it is that they have changed to become this person. However, liking what you looked like then, they never knew how to do. Yeah, meaning they haven't learned how to do that yet. And yeah. so, ha however, if a person is more in love with the process of changing, where yes. they are, then they can have more perspective and more respect and, for it. And they would realize they're not the same person. Yeah. Most of the problem with the people who lose 100 pounds and they're not happy is, is they that... They change their body and they feel the same. But they, the they're same the same, they think they're the same person. So they see themselves exactly at the fatty who was 400 pounds. Well, yeah. actually, no, you're at 300. But the point is, you became a different person than you were at 300. At four, you, know, you were when you yeah. were at 400. Most likely, you'll never go back. You are a different person. You're just not giving yourself the credit for yeah. it. You have made the switch. Anybody who goes from sedentary to active and, you know, like who's done stuff, yeah. like set goals, accomplish them, everything, I mean, you're not the same person anymore. You have learned, but you're going to have to learn to see that you are not the same person anymore. It's such a part of the journey. Yeah. Right? It, it's, that's the journey, realizing that you, make, you, you become a better person as you go, you learn more. It's alpha zero, right? You, every day, you become a little bit of a berger, better version of yourself, or yeah. you go the other way. Yeah. But you have to realize that you're not the same person. And so I think a, a huge job of the coach is not just to motivate to go to the next goal. It's also to give their client perspective on how much they have accomplished. No, it does not make you soft. No, it does not make you stop from wanting more. Yeah. No, it doesn't. But people need perspective to go, look, I've done all that. You have to be able to celebrate victories. Yeah. The small one, the big ones, you have to be able to stop once in a while and go, man, mm -hmm. I made progress. And by the way, I, I do the same shit myself with pool and stuff like that where I'm never happy. But once in a while, I'm like, all right. Yeah. Well, I think it's important that the, the things that you do, do shape who you are. Yes. You know, the things you do and the more so, and I mean doing, the yeah. things you do, yes, the, the, yeah. and, but also the things that you accomplish well, I think they do help. Uh, it's not as important as all the things that you've done to, to get change. There. Yeah. I think the accomplishment at the end is a good validation for you to it's the person measure. that you've become. It's a measure, not of a target. The process. Yeah. It's a measure, not a target. Yeah. I, I, to me, I judge people based on what they endure and based, based on what they do, yeah. not based on the outcome that they reach because too many things go into it, right? That is for me never the measure of a person. The measure of a person is what activity can they do and what activity are they enduring? 
And mm -hmm. that basically the gap between doing and injuring will tell me more or less where they go in life. Yeah. Because I, I mean, the firm believer that people don't go, don't go an inch past what they think they deserve. And that injuring, like you see them doing certain things. And I can always see when they switch from being active, like doing stuff to injuring, which is losing, which is far more passive. And that tells me that they have reached their capacity at the moment because they can't fight past that point. If you, and you'll stop exactly at the point you will are willing to give up. Yeah, That's the difference is doing versus injuring. If you get in life what you're ready to fight for, what you're willing to fight for, the second you go to enduring, that means you do not deserve that thing. I don't, it's not that I think you don't deserve it, it's you think you don't deserve it. Yeah. That's why you go into enduring. You don't think you're capable of fighting whatever that. So now you're passive about it, you're in flight, you're losing, you're willing to accept the suffering instead of fighting it. And that is where you stop in life. Yeah. That right moment when you go from doing to enduring is as far as you will go in your life. And so there's no, that's not a fixed point. Mm -hmm. That's not a destination. That's not an outcome. It's a, where is that arch? Basically, that arch tells you where you stop in life. So what, that's why it's so important. What I want to make sure we do, um, let's cover this last aspect. I want to plug one more thing into yep. the control function before we go. We, we have time, yeah, a little bit of time. Yep. Um, well, I guess we have all the time as long as the batteries roll. But <laughs> Exactly. Doug is sleeping, so we're good. Let's do this. Um, I want to know how the um, Carl Friston and some of the, the, like the prediction model, um, yeah. how how that applies to this process of the control function. Because I look at it from the outside as, when I see this process, I see all of this experience that is completely new, there's no reference, meaning every single imprint feeling experience mm -hmm. is going to be a, a new one, which I think is very positive for learning. Yeah. I think that's how you stay engaged. I think connecting to that process where you're feeling and experience a new thing, you're writing new code, mm -hmm. Um, I think that, like, that's why the, the first and stuff made so much sense to me is more in how it tied into to these basics. Yeah. So if it's you like look, it explained this yeah. better. For so me. I remember the point of the Carl Friston, oh, not the Carl Friston, like what he explained what life is, right? The point of the, the purpose of life is to minimize mistakes, mm -hmm. right? And so that's what you see as a, the, the control function, right? The, the amplitude that you see. Are we going to die? Or is just sorry. There's a beep in the back. I'm wondering if the bomb is going to explode. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's the truck? Yeah. The oh yeah, right. The washing machine stuff. The 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 is the amplitude of the mistake. So basically, yeah. what you see is the amplitude of the surprise. Yes, that's, what that's right. and are. I think it's important yeah. to say this is yeah. in this case it's it's surprise, not mistakes. Yes. Because while we're, we're saying this process is about limiting mistakes, that is a process mm -hmm. of trial and error. There will be mistakes, right. but every one of those things, your surprise, your the, the yeah. prediction becomes more accurate mm -hmm. um, in how you will feel. And so, what's interesting about that is it's never about uh, we're not saying it's it's to minimize surprise, but um, it's not to start at the no surprise stuff because life doesn't. You never have no surprise. No. That's why there is no perfection. So yeah. it's the same thing. What we're saying is the, the, the purpose of life in the Carl Friston way is to minimize surprise, is to make sure that the, that the control function becomes well damped, which means the machine is rolling smoother. Not yeah. smoothly, but smoother, so that there's less shit it's happening. Less deviation. Less deviation. That's all. So either you go less de de uh, deviation, which is life, or you go more deviation, which is death. Yeah. And so life goes either one way or another. When entropy always increases, basically means that the deviation usually get bigger. Mm -hmm. That's what non-life does. That's why the universe goes to one. If it's not alive, the, di the devi deviation just keeps bigger and bigger right. and bigger. So that's the example we're using of a drop of ink into a bucket of water. It disperses. Mm -hmm. It goes all over the fucking place until you can't see the ink anymore. The ink is dead in yeah. that sense. You know I mean? um, and that's why, because the amplitude have increased to a point where it's off the chart, right? What life tries to do is tries to bring the ink back together from, not because the ink is dead, but you get the <laughs> idea, it's, it's the idea. So what, what life tries to do is to minimize the amplitude of mistakes, of mm -hmm. surprises. So life is a well-damped control function. Yeah. That, that's really what the point of life is, is to diminish that, that, that amplitude. And again, it's not to not have an amplitude is not going to happen. There will be surprises in life always. The, it seems that the universe is more is probabilistic, not deterministic. Yeah. There will be surprises. But the goal of life is to learn from that. Mm 
Mm -hmm. right? So what I like about this, again, is the idea of time. It's like we move forward. As we move forward, we learn more and more and more and more and more. And I think but forward only exists if there's a past, right? Yeah. Time only exists because there was something before. Well, it's also that, 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 that forward exists and progress well. exists, but perfection is a thing that I guess you could call it whatever you want to call perfection is in a movement or training yeah. or whatever in your end goal, yeah, but, like, it, but you're just not going to be fully there. So yeah. that while that progress exists, that is the only thing that exists that it's really matters. Journey. Yes, there and, is no destination. Yeah, and, and I think with this, is that also means that you're, as a prediction machine, the yep. way you, as humans we operate, is that that is always a self-correcting automatic process. So these yes. things line up and they run the same fucking way. And, and, I, and yeah. I like that as a, as a concept detached from the body and as a concept Again, that to is. To think this perfection means you're ignoring the fact that there is no life. That's the problem, yeah. is you think you're going to go to that straight line. Yeah. You can't because there is no life. It's like the ink. It's going to try to, to disperse. Entropy mm -hmm. always increases. The point of life is to bring back. So it's like breathing. You yeah. go in and out, and in and out, and in and out. That's how life works. It's in and out, in and out, in and out. It's not just in. So you're never going to reach yeah. perfection. That's the point, is the other side that tries to pull you apart. And your fight against that is what makes you alive. Yeah. So literally, the point is the fucking... Is that you got to start walking thing. that path. Yeah, yeah, it's the thing. It's the path. It's not the destination. There is no destination. Because other, otherwise, you negate either life or non-life. You negate yeah. the fact that there is a duality, a dichotomy, in the universe we live in, which is there's no life on one side, no life on the other. And the truth is there, is that there is both. And then they fight each other if you want to, right? Mm -hmm. Ignoring, thinking, looking for perfection is denying either one or the other. Yeah. Instead of being a nihilist or a vitalist. Well, and a it's vitalist. Just, in, in my opinion too, is that, like denying that as a concept is just being fucking like purposefully ignorant. Well, it's exactly that. that things are. It's either a nihilist or a religious person. Yeah. Like life forever or no life at all. Yeah. Right. Yeah, Both just, are wrong. And you have too many closed doors, and then yes. you're, then everything becomes too narrow. Yeah. And then, but again, that makes you miss half of the equation. And mm -hmm. without the other half, there is no equation. Yeah. And that's a little bit. So if you take the notion of time away from your coaching, that's exactly what you're doing because you're not looking at what happened and you're not looking at the potential forward. In either case, you're missing the point entirely. Life is not a picture, it's a movie. Yeah. You don't get to take, so your coaching is the same. Your coaching is a movie, not a picture. You don't take, you don't get to look at someone move, take a, in your mind a picture of that movement, go, it should look like this, like this or like that. It doesn't work like that. Maybe not today. Like, I mean, it's, it's just, it doesn't work. That's not the, that's not the job. Yeah. The job is better, right? Not, not position, tension. Yeah. Not, you know, more, better. The, the goal of you as a coaching is to get the person to move better. That's it. There is no straight line. There is no outcome. There is no destination. There's only the journey there. If you don't understand that, you form, the, fundamentally don't understand how the universe works. And that's what the Carl Friston and the Schrodinger basically is about. Is that, dual, that dichotomy of what the universe is made for. There are those two forces, right? And it's the balance between the two that get us somewhere. I think... In what is this? Forty-three episodes. I think this is my favorite episode. <laughs> there you go. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, it yeah, was. We're going it, back it, to it the was. Really and and yeah. I think it's the thing we had talked about before. This was. I think we'll we'll revisit every three four episodes. I think we'll, so. I think we'll, we we'll go back and to something that maybe we, you had talked about three years ago, four years ago. But yeah, or like make, you know, the, sure the, the Charles Munger principle. Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, All the one that I listed in my head when I started my yeah. coaching career, truly. And we go and control and function it, was a big one. And, and then think, we go at that. Yeah. yeah, and we can deep dive into that and then and then that way really we can critical mass. Yeah. All of all, it. all the early ones. I think one every three yeah, three podcasts, yeah. three, four podcasts, we should go at all the early principles of strong fit. They're yeah. still valid. Because it, what's funny is I've had these conversations many times and yet have not had them really in depth since we talked yeah. about Friston and we talked yeah, about this. Yeah, because I keep so, pushing this. So it's, uh, but that, you it, see it, it, make, it makes these original conversations or these original mm -hmm. subjects uh, way more, what's the word, comprehensive, yes. I think. But you see, that's why for me, nothing, none of this is new. The Carl Friston stuff isn't new. It's explained better. Yeah. Yeah. It's more advanced. It's uh, proven to it's you like out a, there if you want. Well, and I think I think in your cases, I think you've understood that yes. these things worked and kind of why. Yep. Um, but as something like like as Friston stuff comes along, what that is is it's just a it's a very thorough way of communication that you weren't going to get to on your own. No. To 
how are you going to explain this to me? Yeah. Well, you need this guy's 20, 30, 40 years of experience and thousand papers yeah, and exactly. to then get all that concentrated and then you can unload it to yeah. me in a way where I can pick it. And it's far more, and those guys allow me to be far more precise. Yeah. Because now, by the way, and then there's also an important part is understanding a concept, not being able to apply it means you have not understood it correctly. Yeah. Fully. Fully. Not correctly. Yeah. Fully, sorry, my bad. Fully. So the fact that, like, for example, the Carl Friston on how to fix a prediction, that was a, one of the most brilliant things I've ever read because mm -hmm. that changed the way you feel. I was like, that's what they do. Yeah. And now, like, now, so all that stuff is application, like the book from Paul Levis is like, how do we apply this? Yeah. Now, and that, and that, that is part of a larger understanding. Yeah. So the concepts are always new, but you need to have a broad enough understanding that you can apply it as well, not just know. Yeah. Right? You so, have to communicate to the rest of the human race. So, so these, these larger understandings getting plugged yeah. into the, some, of the, some of the OG cool stuff you've been talking yeah. to, um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Yes, it should be too. a lot of fun. Yep. That is the end of this trip. So when you see us next week, I'll be hopefully thinner, more handsome, right, because more Because that'll tan. be like a month. Three, three yeah, exactly. four weeks away yeah. or something. So. I'll be bigger. Julian will be bigger. Um, I hope I'm just smarter. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Hopefully, too. Hopefully. So, yeah. um, but that's got us about wrapped up for this week. We've got uh, plugs real quick. JuliansCorner.com, operational. Yep. Uh, Strongfit.com has, there you're going to find all the seminars, the workshops. Um, with the delay in this, I'm not going to say any workshop titles, but Strongfit yes. seminars, uh, they're all going to be there. Strongfitequipment.com, strongfitequipment.eu. We've got... Strong Fit One on Instagram, Tyler Manta F. Fitness. Stone on Instagram, Manta Fitness. Manta Fitness is in Australia. They yep. also are on Instagram at Manta Fitness. Um, so they're going to sell their sandbags and apparel. Jeez. Uh, Rue is at uh, OK32. OK <laughs> OK32. Oh, he's coming. Oh, you missed the podcast, dude. Sorry. Oh, sorry, yeah. buddy. <laughs> um, I swear there was another plug I needed to put out there for us. I'll cut you off again. No, it didn't matter. Tyler Effing Stone. Don't, don't worry. I forgot, I forgot before you said anything. Yeah, anyway, you sorry, you yeah. actually just filled it in. So. And the third uh, guest the, is funny. That'll do it next up, week. So there you go. Do it till next week. Host number three just made yeah, it in. Shit. And the dog did not leave the couch the whole time. Yeah, so I, I lost perfect. the bet. I lost the bet. <laughs> yeah, I know. I lost the bet totally. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. And we'll see you next week.